the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos, and articles, and images. We spent a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live, it's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story, they were helping their neighbor. If a family member was being evacuated, my group would just jump in and help out. It was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Hello everyone, I'm geologist Philip Ong. I'm here with Mr. Dane DuPont, HawaiiTracker.com, bringing you guys another Kilauea Volcano update today on Wednesday, February 17th, 2021. This is the 59th day of this ongoing eruption of Kilauea Volcano at its summit in Kilauea Caldera in its main pit of Hale Ma'u Ma'u. As we're looking at the latest video uh, released by the USGS Hawaiian Volcano Observatories here, uh, video taken last week, Friday, February 12th. And this is showing the entry point from the west vent into that lava lake that's been filling the bottom of that crater for just about two months, just shy of the two month milestone that we'll look back on uh, in a little more detail on our Friday uh, update. But today we're going to focus a little more on this on this entry point of the west vent. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, at this point, it's hard to really tell how big that is from this kind of perspective right here. Um, but the estimates seem to be in a range of one to two meters. So somewhere in a range of, uh, you know, four, eight feet, seven and a half feet, somewhere in that range. So maybe the height of a person, you know, from a short person to a tall person, somewhere in that range is about how tall the, the height of the standing dome of lava that's bubbling into the pit, right? And the west vents kind of off screen up here and lava is flowing down kind of in that direction and possibly more in this direction since the level that it's been going into the lake has been drowned over and over as the lake level is deepening and deepening. 
and today sits over 700 feet deep um, over here in this area right here where it's the highest right below the west vent. So let's just, let's just put this video on loop. This is, you know, um, they've, they've, they've noted no major changes um, really to the to the entry point. It's been fairly steady. We saw a lot of changes to the entry point earlier on and we'll review those changes here shortly. But I do want to mention we'll, we'll be taking questions. Uh, Dan will be manning the live streams and checking out the chats and, you know, um, getting you guys' questions on there and then kind of amassing um, a, a set of them for us to check out here uh, at the end of our update today. So this is a video from February 12th, and so kind of you've had a chance to look at it for uh, a couple minutes now. Let me put that one away and show you guys this kind of um, compilation, right, that I put together. That's a little preview of a longer, longer thing we'll release on on Friday. But so this is just just that west entry point. The first video we have is back from December 29th. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll start playing it here. You can see there it is, similar to how it looks now. A couple days later, on December 21st, we had that dome fountain. There's a dome fountain January 2nd. This one's sped up January 6th. It's like still bubbling up, but a little bit slower and more sluggishly. This is really sped up, so really sluggish on January 8th. That was when that eastern part of the crust froze over. Then it reinvigorates and starts really plunging in there. You can kind of see. Then it started pulsing. And you can kind of see the start-stop effect at 500 speed here. And then, you know, some slower pulsing effects here to, to, in the last month. All different views of that west vent entry. Um, and here, the most recent one, February 9th. And there you go. That's the loop. I'll let it loop through one more time. And that's our little bonus today to kind of give you guys a little, little view, just of one little zoomed in part of this eruption. Just that point where that lava goes in from that west vent. The west vent itself has changed. We'll look at that in more detail as well, as has all all the other features in the crater. But right now, I'm just focusing on that little entry point. You can see all the different variations of kinds of entry we've had, and the gas uh, emissions are still reportedly down, according to the USGS. And that's still our question: is uh, how long can it continue at a low rate with what essentially is more sluggish lava coming out before the eruption essentially eventually winds down. It could, it could be a long drawn out process, but that that's, does seem to be the trend with the gases at least. Whereas the GPS is telling us something a little bit more confusing. So we'll kind of wait, wait for more info on that. All right, so here's a, a photograph. It was released uh, back from February, tw February tw 12th last Friday. So the video might have been a couple days before that. So here uh, last Friday, you can kind of see that standing kind of fountain right there, right? And you can see there's a little bit of a, of a lip of a raised edge over there. So you kind of imagine, imagine you know, a, a person standing there about that high, trying to do it a little bit better on a scale today for you guys today. Right? You know, it might be like really like a bench kind of, kind of height right there compared to the lava level. Here's some of the size of that thing. So that's really zoomed into it though. I'll zoom out. You can kind of see here's our, our high, hard island down here at the bottom. And then that was zoomed into just the, that west vent entry point. And now there's this big spatter and cinder cone, kind of a main one, and then a secondary one here from that secondary north vent that opened up a while ago. All right, that seemed fairly small compared to the whole crater, but these are also massive, massive features, as we'll show you guys here shortly. Um, first, I'll show you guys this other view they've released, um, a more of a straight down view. So you can kind of see this open glowing crack and pit that sometimes has been spattering lava. That's where all, where all this apparently loose rock comes from. Right? That's the, the lava that shot out of that hole and then froze in midair and then fell down solid. Or if it fell down still liquid, then that's called the spatter. And that's kind of what, what you're dealing with there. There's different textures of the same lava goop that's coming out. And then kind of vertically way below there, is that that entry point and from there it kind of goes out across that lava lake that western part that's still active so there you go um, there's a lip right there a different point of, point of view they made a point to hike around the caldera and so you can kind of see these pictures and all from their website from different points around the caldera rim where they maybe don't often go and, and make a point to photograph repeatedly so good to have both kind of 
documentation, you know, a lot of photographs from the same place over and over and over again, but also to have a little bit of variety once in a while, we kind of do a, a general survey. So that's what they're, how they're approaching it here. So this is a view they've released uh, through the rangefinder of that West Vent. So you can see a little bit more clearly here. There's still quite a lot of fume, like all through that trace of what we imagine is kind of like a lava tube, right? Kind of crusted over a path of lava that we know can get all the way out, spattering with the gas coming out of these upper parts of the of the vent. But also that in the past, we're kind of gurgling out and flowing down a big kind of chute, right? That seems to be the path of the steam right here. So and then this is a, a image that we can look at this from the um, menu SGS site over close up view of the Western active fissure. And you note here that the cone was measured to be approximately 30 meters, 98 feet tall. Right. So that's an interesting number right there. So I kind of took that and I went to the internet and you can see this live science graphic here. This is the Statue of Liberty. Of course, Statue of Liberty actually has a like a pedestal and a base and all kinds of other stuff like that. But that's not where we're not looking at that. We're looking at from the bottom of that, that big hunk of, of, the, of the actual metal statue, right? So kind of zoomed in right in here. There is a human for scale, right? So we have on here 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters is not quite to the very top of the head, the crown, but you know, I think about it, think of it as like crown to maybe not quite the heel, but right above, you know, right above the ground. That's, that's your more or less possibly within the air height of that vent. Right? So compared to a human, that's your Liberty blue whale is what they were, you know, they're actually, we're, we're, we're talking about King Kong in that article. If you want to go and find, find the source, you can go on a internet hunt there. But what I've done is I've taken that graphic here and I've superimposed it on our own West Vents. This top is kind of obscured, but to take it to be somewhere in here, right? The bottom is kind of right in there. So kind of right above the bottom right there to, that's about the height of that West Vent. And the person down here in black little outline, I'm going to zoom in. And you can kind of see a little bit better there. The size of a person compared to the size of Maybe that lava dome that's popping up there to the size of that bench that's on the edge of the lava lake right there. That's kind of below what's now you can see a pretty big feature. Right? Maybe the spatter when a spatter is shooting out is reaching the top of where this flame is, is shooting out to that, that kind of elevation, right? That's kind of maybe the uppermost reaches of it where stuff is shooting out with the main main edifice kind of being up there. So 100 feet, that's like essentially a 10-story building, another way to think of it, right? I'm going to give you guys a little bit better scale right there. And just to note, you know, that, that whole west vent, that's just this part right in here. That's within this much bigger crater. So now, that, now when you see a picture like this, you can imagine that this little viewpoint right here, right? This upwelling point, that's maybe the height of a person, more or less, plus or minus. And then we zoom out and you can kind of imagine the size of the whole, the whole thing, kind of in comparison. Still, still hardy at the scale, but that's kind of more, more or less what we have right here. So this picture is uh, going back from last week. Here's a more recent one, February 12th as well. This is from the northwest. So we have our west vent kind of at the bottom right for a slight change rather than the bottom middle. And we have the active part of the lake, this western part over here, and then the eastern part kind of over there. It's a little bit different view on the horizon, different kind of angles. You can really see how, how clear this sulfurous uh, north bank really is. And it's really interesting there. All right. And then another photograph was released. This is kind of zoomed in to the edge. That big island is over here to the left. Not quite visible. So what you can see kind of at a glance is here's that little hook we were looking at last week that's kind of emerged from the edge of the island. Where the lava level is now almost, almost uh, high enough to resubmerge it again, it looks like, but that had re had emerged as the island and the lava lake and everything has been adjusting its height to the changing pressures of lava coming in. Looks like there's almost like a small little island or a little crust of raft rafted right there. And you can see that that more obvious lip, the edge of active lava, where it's made a little levee for itself. 
a little margin where when it spills over it leaves a layer upon layer that builds the level of that perched swimming pool of lava up higher and higher. So this is actually uh, something we can zoom in on. We can check out that appears to be you know, maybe a, some piece of an island or some piece of something that, that got swept along over there or you know it's hard to tell from this angle how high it actually is above the rest of the lava over there but it looks like it looks like it's different it's kind of stuck you see fresher stuff all around it so it does appear to be like like an island there and can i zoom over here to the left a little more and here is that big that big hook shaped feature a peninsula a low peninsula and then up here is that higher cliff where the lava level reached this higher level up here when it was really frothing early on in the eruption. So, all right, we'll see. We'll keep an eye on this, this thing, see if it gets submerged again in the next few days as the lava level comes up again over the weekend, perhaps. But that's kind of, you know, the little details we're looking at now, whereas the eruption has been fairly stable, not a whole lot of changes uh, in the grand scheme of things here. Um, one last photograph here, panorama from the southeast. This is from uh, uh, a culturally significant uh, place uh, known as Akani Kolea, uh, featured in Hawaiian legends. And they write that although a lake from the ongoing eruption in Hale Magumau is not visible from here, Akani Kolea afforded an excellent wide-angle view of features from the 2018 caldera collapse. So maybe today you can't you can't quite see the bottom of the pit in a lava lake from from this place that's mentioned in legends. I'm gonna better kind of zoomed in view here, right? So here's a kind of close foreground. I'll pan out past that first cliff, past the second cliff, past the third cliff, and down in there. That's where the lava is way down in there. This is that 800 meter contour somewhere right in there. So you can't quite see it right here, but of course, who knows in the past what the shape was before, right? Maybe you had a maybe you had a pit more in this direction in the past, right? We but we do know that previous cutter collapses were a lot more to the east as well, not not just confined to the western side of the caldera. So maybe that's why you could possibly see you know multiple of these deep pits that occurred in different places across the caldera, but. Current one not directly visible yet uh, with the current lava levels, and you know along those lines they do note uh, on here kind of very slightly address the question that always comes in right um, uh, the great expanse of the eastern downdrop block dropped more than 100 meters 330 feet and at current eruption rates it'll be years until it could spill over onto the older caldera floor. There we go. Akani Kolea. What you got, Dane? About five questions asking something similar to that. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering what, uh, like, uh, the USGS addresses, you know, a frequently asked question. I was like, oh, which one? You know, <laughs> there are, yeah. s there are a dozen, probably at least, that are, uh, very frequently asked. Yeah, so that's that's the best clue, best most recent clue, you know. And of course, we're talking about that that down drop block that's this one in the foreground over here, right? And for you to reach that, it would still, at current rates, take years. That's what they're saying. Current eruption rates that'll take years. Or maybe they're referring to the caldera floor that's a little higher up here for it to actually reach the fill this in and spill onto here, and that would take years. I think that's that may be what they're actually saying in there. All right. And Kanakakoi Overlook is just a few hundred meters or yards to the east with a very similar view to this. Of course, they wanted to kind of look right from this exact place for cultural reasons and kind of document it and share it so that everyone can go here and, you know, you can go to their website and click on this, download the original, and you can zoom way in like this and you could you know um, immerse yourself in a view right there right you can kind of see you're in a background you have a snow-capped Mauna Kea right there and over snow-capped Mauna Loa 
as well. So a really great, great uh, photograph here. Might be one of those ones that's worth. Look at that. You can see. Oh, I'm trying to zoom in a little more for you guys here. See the end of the road right there. There's the road and the drop off right over there. So those are the photographs we have uh, from the image update today. As far as the monitoring data, you can see here our tilt plot. And the most important thing on this plot is something you probably can't see with from your view, but 0 0.4 to minus 0 0.4, only a 0 0.8 microradian span across the whole chart. So all these little wiggles are just little wiggles in the end, even if they're kind of we're zoomed way in on them, we can see a variation of up and down of a half a microradian. And these these might be changes that relate to processes like gas movement or other movement of the ground. Um, but it's kind of at this level less significant than a bigger scale deflation inflation events. Looking back at the last week, you can kind of see here's the last couple of days all wiggling within that barely half microradian up or down. And about a week ago we were down four microradians from where we are now. And looking at the last month, you can kind of see in there we, we've, we're at a stable high that we got to after a couple of deflation inflation events. Deflation inflation, deflation inflation event. Which followed a couple of those we had earlier in the month. So that's maybe the, the latest pair of them. And so, you know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll wait and see how long this long flat lasts. You'd expect at some point you get another deflation inflation event just because of some some process we think of as being in the background that's happening all the time whatever whatever causes it has it seems to be happening on a, on a regular basis over the years for the most part all right gps no no major change there or on east rift zone so nothing really worth noting on either of those locations here's our s1 cam view so you can kind of see a similar not a whole lot of change there that you can still clearly see that outline, that dark edge, so the lava hasn't quite reached up to that, that upper rim yet. Um, it still kind of hasn't, hasn't refilled to that high point. So kind of below that at this point, and now we can scroll down here to the USGS HVO automatic 24 hour time lapse. You can kind of see the circulation is in the same places in that same crescent shaped area right there and that's kind of with a big island on its eastern edge of it and a lot of coming out the western vent the base there's that there's that entry point and the vent points of the gas right above there although you guys can see there's clearly some other gas vents all around that crater wall right and so right probably a path of of magma to lava coming comes in some way that the gases are able to move out through these cracks even as the lava comes out of this hill over here. And that's the S1 camera. Here we have the thermal camera. And uh, same, similar kind of pattern looking from the west. So I'm going to change my color here. We have north off in this direction and that similar kind of crescent over here. There's still a few, few little cool spots that are those, those older islands. This, is, this being your heart island right over here in the foreground. Something like that. In the animation for the last 24 hours. And then see you kind of get some repeated crystal overturning, the foundering. Right, there's that kind of, kind of zoom in there, that looks like that piece of island or cold or crust that's stuck over there on that edge that we zoomed in on that photograph interesting feature and then there's that long curved hook we we're pointing at the easiest place to see it is on, a, on this thermal image so you can see like, a lot more activity close to the western vent over here but you still have it seems like circulation all the way to maybe maybe around here and then maybe this this outer bay might have the crustal foundering only and we look over here at the north edge of it and a similar kind of feature you see more crustal foundering at the edge, like on the fingers, it's got a couple of fingers of foundering, and then there's a main, main flow area right in there. Let me make that a little, little bigger for you guys to see. Right. Like a finger over here, and a finger over here, and then a main arm of it off this way. And once again on the other side. 
and just one big zone where it's where it's doing that doing that this southern bay being more actively you see it constantly circulating or churning right and possibly going underneath this crest squeezing up on the outer edge occasionally from time to time all right that's the thermal camera and the depth has been kind of steady really and it's been very slowly rising so it's risen maybe a, maybe less than a half a meter um but in that range where, where it's still in a rising trend very very slowly the newest number is the same as we had a couple of days ago 217 meters we gained a foot so 712 feet 217 meters intermittent crystal foundering that's a lava update and they've corrected the SO2 emission rates to 1200 tons per day and they're saying that was uh, February 16th, the most recent measurement. That's yesterday. So still a, net, a, a third measurement down in the thousands here, or second or third. Uh, but certainly still at, the, at those lowest levels we've seen, 1,200 tons per day. And so it's, those are not quite making it on the graph here. But if you put the 16th, that data point comes way down here. So the pattern for the whole month was we're up at 60,000. 50,000 and we've kind of been on this long slow decline for most of the eruption. I mean, this is all the first week right here where it peaked up in that 50, 60,000 tons per day range and then ever since then it's been below 10 tons, 10,000 tons per day and now we're getting close to you know, around 1,000 tons per day instead of around 5,000 where we were earlier here in this earlier phase. So that is what it looks like a little bit more zoomed in. That first week right there. And then below 10,000 ever since then. And a slow, gradual decline. Occasional variations up and down, right? But, you know, um, I think there are probable prices, some more data points down in here. It's the low end right here. Okay. So gas is still coming out. Here is our VOG forecast. Uh, wind to the southwest, so uh, mostly that ocean view area, uh, south Kona, mid Kona regions where the, where the wind kind of flows and traps around in there. Typical, just want to make sure we document that. And last thing before we turn to our questions uh, will be the earthquakes. And so here's our most recent earthquakes. There's a 0 0.7, there's a 2.1, there's Maybe a few more earthquakes, but maybe very slowly increasing. Nothing alarming happening in Mauna Loa. We know magma is still going in there, and so it's still causing earthquakes to happen, but not at any alarming rate. The deep feeder zone of Pahala still active, long-term pattern, and quiet um, in the last couple of days, especially right. All the yellow ones are the past week. The orange ones are the past two days, past day, and then the red ones be the past day past hour, past couple hours. So nothing in the past uh, couple days here at the summit or in the south flank of Kilauea. It's been pretty quiet. All right, Dane, so let's turn to some questions and then we'll, you know, as usual, we'll, we'll feature some of our island photographers at the end. And, right. um, yeah. All right, well, uh, you know, thank you, Phil. We, I do want to thank Hawaii Tracker for making this uh, possible. Hawaii Tracker is a social media site based on uh, building communities. The best way you can help us out if you're watching this video is to like and subscribe, share it. We don't have a social media uh, a marketing budget like many organizations. We rely on word of mouth of the viewers. So you sharing this video helps us out a lot. Second big way to help is to become a member on HawaiiTracker.com, become part of that community. And then third, maybe consider making a uh, donation on whitetracker.com slash support. That is where we take our donations. Um, we do have one donation uh, on White Tracker. I wanted to get to uh, mention Renzo. Uh, thank you for that. <clears throat> and also, um, you know, we got to mention our sponsor, uh, Kaleo's Bar and Grill in Pahoa, a you know, picture of uh, the Pahoa, you know, scene for anybody that visits, even for, you know, locals, I go in there regularly, uh, you know, the fish and chips in there is incredible, especially when they got the, you know, mahi-mahi, it's just, it's, you know, the best. Um, 
yeah, we just wanted to thank them. Uh, appreciate it. And yeah, let's get into some questions. All right. So a lot of questions about the, um, the, the, the lava lake, but more specifically the fountain that you're covering mm -hmm. uh, in the cone. Uh, from YouTube, CHS asks uh, that it looks like the cone of the lava lake it, or the cone is almost submerged by the lava now. How long at the current rate before it is actually submerged? Well, I, I don't know if I'd say it's almost submerged because it's still there's still 100 feet left right of it to get to the top of that thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, and, and it's true that it has grown taller um, even as the lava level has come up. So the original entry point has been drowned for sure. And that's something something we can kind of see if we um, were, to, were to maybe, maybe in the next update would bring up a time lapse that shows that change of the lava level compared, compared to the west vent. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, but at, you know, at the current rate, that's really hard to tell because you know it's 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 not just ri raising the lava above the the that level below the the west vent, but it's also injecting beneath that crest over in the east and rising, raising that whole thing upwards, right? So actually, you actually can still fit lava underneath that whole crater, really, to some degree. So that's why, you know, that's why it's really hard to right. say, right? You know, um, we made some projections for fun early on, like, you know, kind of because because the early projections of eruption rates were pretty were pretty high that I made it kind of interesting to think about that. And as we kind of adjust to the the reality of what looks like to be a long term lower eruption rate, then it's harder to do those kind of things because you know it's it's hard to say how how long, what it ends up averaging at. You know, like we we start out maybe at six, we've done maybe four, maybe we end up averaging at three. If we if we kind of keep ramping down for a long time, you know, so it's hard to really say make the projections accurate. But ballpark, you know, um, months, you know, um, right. if it were to really start pumping, maybe weeks. But mm -hmm. you know, um, it have to be pumping. You know, pumping for for a few weeks probably. Yeah. Really have to kick up. All right, so Douglas asked a very related question. Is it possible that any of these submerged vents are adding lava or draining lava from the lake? Um, is the western vent the only vent releasing lava, or could it be coming in from somewhere else too? Seems like it could be coming in from somewhere else too, or releasing from somewhere else. That's certainly possible. But you know, I would, I would say that by now, probably the easiest path out is going to be the west vent, right? Because the thing has been flowing, running for all but the first month of uh, first week of the eruption right so it's been going six weeks right six and a half weeks already you know constant flow of think about what volume of magma of lava has come out through that crack and how right. that might have you know um, worn it wider perhaps whether it's the, the the heat of it or the the friction from the bubbles or you know what, what whatever you have you know whatever whatever it may be all right, we do have a uh, Sue Daniel made a uh, donation on, or Sue D made a donation on uh, Ytracker.com, and then Sue Daniel asks, "Is the uh, is the lava lake is the lava filling out uh, from the crusted side from underneath like a giant blister, or is it just is it draining somewhere else?" I think I think it is it is filling out that crusted side. Yeah, yeah. It is kind of swelling, right? You know, so um, we've shown some videos in the past of how that back crust has been rising um, over time, and that's continued. You know, uh, we can kind of update it um, in the future here, but you know, it's the same process has been happening where it's just kind of rising up and rising up and you know, kind of a slow, steady pace. So, yeah, and, you know, uh, when you look at the thermal camera, you do see those squeeze ups and that, that warm ring that they've that they've described around the outside of it. So yeah, it is definitely leaking out of the sides. And in the meantime, it seems like the top is getting more solid. Right? You don't see like any lava coming through it. I saw that maybe one time um, in the last month and a half or so. And otherwise, it's been right. solid. Yeah. We have a thirty dollars super chat from Gary Bryan on YouTube. He says, awesome work, as usual. Uh, thank you, Gary. Appreciate it. Um, so we have, I like this question. Uh, witness me on 
YouTube asks, uh, has Holly Mau Mau ever had more than one lava lake in it at once? That that may be the case. Um, it's it's a so the the um, it's we don't have a picture of anything like that. It hasn't happened right. in the Western historical record. I can say that right. Um, there. There is a big layer of a very thick tephra of the reticulite variety. For those of you guys who know what that means, you know, kind of much frothier, like the Hawaiian version of pumice, really frothy, frothy rock that you get from really tall lava fountains. It's a big, thick layer of that that's kind of on a north rim of Kilauea caldera, and um, that. It's, it's been mapped as being a result of multiple fountains coming out of the out of the crater walls of some kind of big collapse. Uh, maybe I can find a um, uh, image here. I think I have a cross section of that here somewhere. Um, but uh, at that time, maybe when you had multiple high fountains, because they actually map multiple high fountain dispersal patterns at the same time. So you had to have multiple high fountains like on opposite sides of the, of the caldera coming out of the cracks on both sides at the same time. And so they were spraying outwards and filling inwards and there were multiple pits at the time. So I would bet at that point in time that you did get those. So let me see if I can um, find that here real quick. Um, came across it just the other day. But... I will have to get I'll line up another question while I, while I look for it, Dane. All right. Because we do have some interesting questions. Um, the... Oh, there. I found it. All right. Let's All right. Let, me, let me get it on the screen here. Um, just a second. Gotta... Um, hold on. And there it is. All right. So I'll have to find find the source for this for you guys later. But this is essentially from the the era of uh, research Don Swanson has done on this kind of golden tephra, right? So this is the, the, their conceptual model where they think they might have had multiple vertical fountains. And so that you can kind of see this is a, a cross-section across the cutter wall with different kind of blocks, like different steps going down or different things, right? And then kind of in the middle, some different ones. And they have up here red dots and black dots. You know, the, the black dots are dense class. The red dots are the lighter reticulite class. And the, that's kind of the pattern that you're seeing on a crater wall is to get that kind of pattern. They say you have to have multiple fountains. Here's one fountain going up. Here's one fountain going out at an angle. Then on the opposite side of the crater, they got one going this way, and they got one going up this way, all at the same time in theory, right? And so they have actually drawn here on this black. There is a lava lake. There is a lava lake. And then there is a lava lake. And there is a lava lake. And then you kind of get some lava falls going into the lava lakes. So when you have a lot, a lot of different pits with a much bigger collapse, then you know if you have an eruption that happens like this, and the reason I bring it up is it's not just a fantasy; like this has actually been published as a possibility based on the deposits we've seen, right? So there you go. Best I can do. All right. So. Um... Is there any indication, Josh asks, uh, is there any indication of the eruption rates increasing? I see. To, I seem to see a lot of uh, more eruptions in the last year over the entire globe. No, I think global eruption rate is something different, different too. And so I'd have to look into more detail on that and, you know, maybe go to the, the Smithsonian or the Global Volcanism Program, um, kind of get that kind of view. But normally you have to integrate over some amount of time that's long enough to account for natural variations and rock type from place to place and whatever else. So um, 
I, I, I don't don't believe eruption rates have, are, have gone up. We we have the most monitoring and the most media now of any time, and that's usually what I attribute it to is that it's better coverage, and you know you have more views, uh, multiple views. You know people with cam with cameras or satellites looking at everything all the time now, right? And everyone has access right. to it. So usually it's more of that than the fact that there's more of them erupting. And on our on our volcano in particular. Uh, the SO2 rates are usually what I take as the, the strongest link to the eruption rates, and they've been going to steady going down. So that's why I also believe eruption rates kind of follow that, have been going down. And correspondingly, the gas content probably also goes down, kind of all, all wrapped in one. All right. Um, Natasha asks, is it fairly normal for the SO2 readings to be this low with an ongoing eruption? Well, it's yeah, it's hard hard to, hard to know what you, what what normal really is, right? Um, but we can say that during the pool oil eruption, when it was just pool oil, it was in the range of two thousand to four thousand tons per day out of just pool oil. And then when the summit vent at Haile Mau opened up in, from two thousand eight to two thousand eighteen, then it was putting out most of two thousand to four thousand tons per day, and pool oil dropped to one hundred to two hundred tons per day only. So. If from that point of view, pool oil had a lot lower emissions, but it was at the same time as the emissions were getting kind of funneled off up the pipe at Hale Ma'u Ma'u, and they were putting two to four thousand. So across the whole volcano as a whole, right, it was always in that two two thousand to four thousand range for a long, long, long time. Mm -hmm. So um, it we haven't seen seen eruption at a thousand sustained, but you know we also have been collecting gas data continuously since you know since that long, right? You know. So we have a few decades of it, but you know we don't have, you know, we don't have it going back to the the earliest times. All right, Dorothy from YouTube asks, "How hot is the estimated lava temperature? It flows like water. Has it uh, gotten hotter?" It's I I haven't we haven't heard any of the details of the specifics and the temperature of the lava. Um, but uh, normally there is a range of somewhere in a range, you know, I mean, you know it, it might come out at somewhere in a range of 2100, 2200 Fahrenheit, right? And it might, you know, cool down, you know, there's a, there's a range of it and, you know, it depends how gassy it is and how hot it is both and also how long it's been sitting in the ground with how many crystals in it um, to how, how smoothly it flows, right? You can kind of see just in the looping video we have here of that West Vent entry, how it, Sometimes it comes out, seems like more gooey, and other times it's more bubbly and gassy, right? And other times it's, mm -hmm. you know, you know, um, it's, it, it's hard to tell with all the, the, the light, the different cameras, different lighting, different times of the day to kind of compare the color of it as much, right? You know, like this is a spectacular view at night, but it's hard to compare that to the daytime. But you can clearly see, you know, more lava's coming out and then starting and stopping, starting and stopping. Yeah, we don't have an exact answer, right? You know, in Celsius, right. you know, maybe 1160 to 1180 might be a reasonable guess, you know. The Vicky Lewis asks, what's the highest level that the lava lake has reached in recent years? So basically, what was it prior to 2018? Yeah, so in, in 2018, it was uh, 900 feet higher than it is right now. And by what, 300 meters higher. Hmm. Yeah. Catherine from Facebook asks, is uh, they heard that Don Swanson was giving some kind of online talk this Friday. Have you heard anything about that? I have not come across that yet, but uh, it would be fantastic if he does. And uh, if so, we'll share that for sure. Right. Zeus uh, says, you mentioned lava was uh, traveling underneath the ground uh, towards Pu'o, but not past Pu'o. That was so that was uh, earlier on um, when as, as we were building pressure before the eruption began, there were signs of inflation all the way to Pu'o, right? And now there are signs of contraction all the way to Pu'o. So as eruption in the summit is ongoing, we seem to think the lava is going away from Pu'o back towards the summit or it all went already and now the ground is kind of sagging and relaxing in response still because it's drained out and there's less pressure there than, than at any point recently. Lots of questions about is it draining back? Is it uh, 
erupting from underneath the lava lake uh, through those uh, vents that have been covered. It, um, it, yeah, it's really, you know, um, we'll have to wait for more information right now. I mean, it, it, there's all kinds of science that happens all the time that, you know, we're, we're kind of providing, you know, something of like a real time live analysis, but there's a lot more in depth science that's happening all the time. These guys are picking up like their acoustic signals, all different vibrations, all different kinds of seismic energy. Um, there, there's all kinds of data that can, they can pull out of this if they're not trying to do it, like, you know, with a five second turnaround. Right. So, you know, mm -hmm. um, we'll probably learn a lot more about the details of all that in the future. You just don't know right now. It's too soon. Right. But there is a data being collected that might give some insight into what's going on. You know, um, if, for example, the frequency of, the, you know, harmonic sounds coming out changes, you could say that something's changed about the vents or maybe certain vents have each have their own particular frequency that, that, that based on their shape. So you can tell which ones are active. I don't know. It might be something like that. that you know, it might be a more novel way to look at it, but I haven't certainly haven't heard of that of that or you know any results but i do know that it's it is standard to collect that kind of data acoustic data and seismic data and all that other stuff and so if it's in there someone will be super excited to find it i'm sure and we'll you know we'll we'll present it in due time all right so good question pure panda from youtube uh asks is the lava lake different now uh the lava lake in the 2010s was fed directly from the chamber through the conduit this one is fed by a, a fissure. Is it possible for the fissure to get large enough to feed the lava lake to become a conduit? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's that's how you essentially make a conduit, right? I mean, um, you started off with the very, very beginning, the very first time after the collapse, you have to have some kind of fissure that comes up. And, you know, yeah, it maybe doesn't occur quite at the elevation that the western fissure is now, the western vent is now. It could come out a little lower in theory. Right. If we if our crack had opened up only the north vent and not that western side, then maybe the eruption would have ended sooner, just because it would have drowned itself and you know would have had to had to wouldn't have had long enough to open that pathway. But the longer the eruption keeps going through that west vent, you know, kind of it opens it opens it up slowly but surely, yeah, a little bit every day, you know. So I mean, I think it, it it could be that could be the case. I think you know if if the lava level keeps coming out slowly and definitely, it could fill up, drown the vent, just kind of keep coming out from below, right? Most of the early data of lava lakes, in the early days, the lava comes up from bubbles up from below, and only when it actually drained away did people have a chance to try to try to go and map out what it actually looked like underneath the lava, kind of like now. And unless it drains away, you really can't tell what's down there, right? unless you have something in real time collecting data like acoustic data or seismic data or you know very specific little 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 sensor yeah, i mean who knows you know we could grab the gravity data maybe you know i mean who knows what, what kinds of things they're deploying right we have an idea that's why we look back from time to time on the 2018 eruptions and that kind of research being, being presented now it's like it's an insight to what they're doing now on this eruption that will get presented on in two years from now when it, when it all gets worked up yeah it's an interesting uh, question. There is one that's going to go back to your lecture on the hotspots. Junior and Davis the uh, third. He asks, uh, "Is there any chance that the hotspot feeding Hawaii Island chain from the Emperor chain uh, from the mantle plume was made uh, by these?" made by the Siberian traps after it was plate locked? I, I suppose so. I'd, I'd, I'd have to look a little bit more, in more detail at that, the history of that part of Siberia and, you know, um, especially the rates that, that it's traveled to see if it could get from the area of the Pacific where we believe that plume head would have been to uh, where it currently sits, you know. Um, I, I kind of feel like it might be a little bit too far um, but I, I, without knowing the details of geology over there, I really, I can't really say for sure. All right. We have a comment from Catherine on Facebook. She uh, posted, it looks like a zoom webinar description, uh, presenter Don Sonson this, uh, Friday, uh, how Pele, uh, he, Aliaka chants and other Hawaiian oral traditions relate to Kilauea's volcanic or, uh, history, 1400 to 1800 CE. Um, yeah, just make a zoom and will you, if you're non UH, it seems like it's a UH Hilo presentation. 
Uh, if you're non UAT low, you can still get a link. You have to email. I'll drop it in both chats or I'll drop it in the YouTube chat. If you're on Facebook, it is in the chat. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like like a great thing to catch. You know, uh, Don updating his research on uh, Hawaiian cultural connections and trying to glean some information out of the the old stories and, and chants that really are, are Hawaiian science, right? When they record, you know, Pele moving from place to place, or talking about eruptions happening in place to place, or you know, different characters or different kinds of eruptions and you know, different features. You know, they're all they're all important things that Don Don has pulled out of there, right? Including the fact that there used to be ponds of water at some point at the bottom of the collapsed pits, right? Um, I've heard in the past up to four uh, ponds of water. Uh, I've also heard other HVO scientists say that there were no ponds of water, so I mean, you know, kind of interesting to hear if there's an update to that. Well, right. I've been listening for. All right, very good. Um, let me make sure there is no more questions. I think we got through the vast majority of them. Many of them are kind of similar to each other. I don't want to get too redundant on them. We do answer, you know, several of these questions in previous episodes, and for viewers that are regulars and don't think they want to hear the same questions answered every episode, but um... yeah. So yeah, thanks guys. Thanks for those great questions. Yeah, we'll, we'll answer as right. many as we can. This one uh, I can just comment on. How does the elevation of the lava lake currently compare to Fissure Eight? Um, so in general, the with the summit's three thousand five hundred feet above sea level, and Fissure Eight is about eight hundred feet above sea level, just rough, rough um, elevations. But yeah, that does it for me today on the question side of things. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, chat. Yeah, just one more thing, Dan, if you want to briefly mention, I can throw on here, uh, you know, we have a, a, a post you wrote up in Hawaii tracker today, the roads for recovery. When you right. The eruption of the Kilauea. And, you know, uh, the, the graphic that Dan made here of Highway 132 has been the one that's been repaved. Already, Already, and then yeah. everything in yellow is, you know, with, uh, on a slate on the schedule in some way. Anything you want to say about it? Yeah, the the there is one new thing here. Um, many of the talk that we talked, you know, discussed about road recovery previous did include the Poiki Road. The you can see these in yellow across the red lava flow. The reestablishment of that back down to Poiki Beach, but the new one that got dropped on us. Uh, was that Highway 137 from Kapoho to Poiki was uh, slated to be redone as well. And that's about 3.6 miles worth of road, whereas previously the talk was about doing only a couple hundred feet of it just to give access to the Kapoho beach lots. Anybody that was trying to return to those, those roads are shown, as uh, Philip can highlight those roads maybe, mm -hmm. where that uh, subdivision once stood. And yeah, so this is a, you know, it's awesome to be able to take care of this. Um, it's going to take some time, of course, you're, when you're dealing with the federal government, there's all kinds of T's and I, T's that need to be crossed and I's that need to be dotted and going back to the design boards, it, you know, gets, gets absurd sometimes, but it's on the docket. Um, tentative timelines are looking like 2021, 2022 for start times on most of these, uh, even late 2022 for the uh, Highway 137. But the good thing is, is uh, there's progress being made and there's deadlines being set. Even if they're soft deadlines and they're tentative and it's, you know, if everything goes well, this is what we're going for. Hey, it's better than nothing, right? And, you know, road recovery down here is, is incredible because some of these areas, you can see how you had at Poiki. Maybe you could show that where it mm -hmm. is for um, everybody. Prior to the eruption, you had three major uh, roadways to go to that area. You had the Highway 137 going north to Kapoho, the Poiki Pohoa Road, and then 137 from uh, Poiki to Kalapana. Well, now uh, after the eruption, it was down to zero. And then Mayor Harry Kim came in and uh, did a emer uh, under the emergency proclamation, did a Highway 137 temporary repaving, ran some bulldozers over the top of it, throw some recycled asphalt on it, called it good for you know temporary purposes, and it worked. So now this is going to be redoing that road more permanently, um, which is awesome. You know, it, 
the one of the things that people were talking about out here after the eruption was the road to recovery begins with a road, right? Because a lot of people, they, they could not get home. They could not get back to the places that they grew up or the places that they, you know, sustain their uh, livelihoods. So this is, you know, great news for on that avenue. The next one we hope to be hearing about is uh, the dredge at Poiki. I do have a video that I'm editing up. Uh, we went back, or I went back down to Poiki to look at the temperatures of the hot ponds. If those that haven't been aware of those, there were hot, there was hot ponds previous to 2018 eruption down at Poiki, but they were more of warm ponds. They were near body temperature. Since then, or in the, the year and a half following the eruption, the water temperatures stayed roughly the same as they were previous to the eruption, no change. And then six months ago, eight months ago, we saw a increase in temperature going from body temperature to about 106, 105 degrees Fahrenheit. So it turned it into a you know, hot tub, a hot, hot tub. And we went down, uh, we've been recording those over time to see what was happening. Philip offered up an explanation of that. The, uh, that's just the amount of time it takes for the heat to percolate through the system, the groundwater, the freshwater table, that the, the amount of time that the water takes to travel in that system is not the same as the, the time it takes yeah. for heat to travel. So the heat got there quick, quicker than the, the actual water did. And now we're seeing that increase in temperature and we're just kind of tracking it, making sure seeing what's happening down there, but also uh, looking at the, beach, the, uh, the new beach down there, which came in also following the 2018 eruption. Uh, huge beach, uh, hundreds of feet in dimensions, and completely blocked the area's only boat ramp. Just We're talking about one of the big, highest grossing boat ramps in the state, completely locked out. Uh, nobody can get in and out. And it's been that way since. Right so on. that's just a little teaser for what's coming. Yeah, so yeah, go check out, check out our past coverage on Pohuiki and future coverage coming up as well right there. That's Pohuiki. Well, the, the, hopefully the next thing we'll hear about announcement for recovery infrastructure in the area. So we'll just finish off here with a few final photographs. Here's a photograph uh, from Harry Durgan a couple weeks ago. The way creator, you a nice sky view here. See some constellations up there. And another one from uh, Stephen Davies. Probably my morning with a nice filter on there. So a couple, couple photographs. And I could just give a quick quick shout out here to, you know, a volcano across the world. A picture from Etna from yesterday. You see there's a paroxysm, as I call them, big high level fountains. And I'm not at all an expert on Etna. Um, there are probably people are have much more to offer on that, but just kind of put a word out that that is going on out there. I think it started up again. Um, today another time maybe not quite quite as intensely as that but interesting effect right here and this one photograph I just want to look at this you know it was just because this is interesting you see there's a whole layer of snow in here right so this first first uh flow of lava that comes down is actually making a giant giant steam cloud also and vaporizing mm. all that all that snow it's kind of something that they noted in their updates so there's a little shout out to italy over there and a shout out to Dorothy uh, with a YouTube super chat, twenty four ninety nine. Love your channel, great information. Thank you, Dorothy. Hello, Dorothy. All right. So, anything else, Dane, before we sign off? Uh, yes, we are being asked about what times we are streaming. The next time we are planning on streaming is Friday at five p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Um, next week, we may be going to a two day a week schedule and keeping that. Uh, while the volcano is in a stagnant state or a uh, consistent stable. state, stable, there you go, um, stable state, we're going to take a little bit of time and, you know, be ready for the next time we have to go uh, live streaming in the middle of the night again, you know. Yeah. Um, we, we, we can also catch catch up on Pohuiki, catch you guys, there's, there's other things that we have our have our hands and we want, you want to make sure that we also give the attention they deserve you know um so um that will, will just mean more great content for you guys in the long term so we're just gonna gonna downshift right. a little bit yeah um until a time as where we you know it's warranted to to shift again 
Yep. Well, that does it for me. Thank you guys. Mahalo, mahalo, you guys for for watching. Thanks for the questions. On behalf of Dan Dupont, I'm Philip Hong. Aloha. <laughs>